Carmen Wilde, and this is Business Without Barriers, the show proving you can break through barriers if you bring humanity back to business. And we're in for a bit of magic today. Our guest, Wes Colson, started his entrepreneurial journey at the age of eight. He turned his love for magic into a business by training other kids to do magic. Well, how cool is that? That's pretty industrious. He wanted to study astrophysics, but opted for business. He'd already started and sold a restaurant in his early 20s, got into real estate, buying, selling properties, renovating and flipping them, then launched an independent real estate agency. When he moved to Mauritius, he started MW Property, which he still runs today. He also launched Morilux, uh, specializing in high-end vacation homes. He's the co-founder of a number of ventures, namely Tasket, Sasco Capital, Crypto Fish, and Eagle Trade, and hosts the Let's Talk Crypto podcast. Oh, and he also loves to jam on his guitar. <laughs> the man who knows how to cross boundaries and break through barriers. It's so great to have you on the show today. Welcome, Wes. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, wow, what a what an introduction! Um, geez, <laughs> I'm 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 uh, flattered by all the uh, the points that you've got there about me. Um, yeah, great to be on your show, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to what what we're going to talk about today. Me too. So we're going to start right at the beginning. Being in the world of magic must have done some wonders for you as a kid. What what? How did it make your life different? Well, wow, good question. Well, I mean, everybody loves magic. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a universal thing. Everybody likes to be uh, entertained and everybody likes that feeling of wonder and, um, and, and you, everybody's curious. So um, you can imagine as a kid seeing uh, magic. I don't think there's any kid that would disagree with this. When you see a magician, you see the first time you see a magic trick, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And of course, you want to know how, how it's done, but there's a piece of you that, that also wants to... <clears throat> feel that wonder and that enchantment uh, when, when you see it happen. And I think magic, uh, as, is, as a kid anyway, uh, taught me uh, a lot of discipline in terms of, uh, you know, having to do things in certain procedural ways, uh, communicating with people. It also put me in front of people uh, at a very young age where I would be uh, you know, in front of a large audience, you know, over a thousand people uh, doing shows, you know, fashion shows, for example, I would come on on the interlude and I would do some, uh, some feats on stage. You know, it puts you in front of a lot of people at a very young age. Uh, you learn to put yourself out there and make mistakes and, um, and people give you a chance. You learn that people give you a chance. Uh, a lot of things which probably at the time that you're doing it, you don't realize that you're actually learning. Um, and you take it with you as you go along. But if I had to trace a few things back, it would definitely, uh, you know, some of the, the properties that you that I picked up or traits that I've picked up over the years or that I use over the years um, must have come or stemmed from, from the days when I was doing magic as a kid. Um, it's definitely helped me uh, enjoy talking to people um, and, and entertaining people and uh, making sure people are happy. What a fabulous thing to be able to do. And it must have been quite a colorful childhood, being able to have something that people actually wanted to surround you uh, and, and be curious with. That it's quite an extraordinary ability to have. Yeah, definitely. It definitely was. I mean, certainly whenever we, I was out and out and about or wherever I was, there was always uh, someone who knew that I, I was uh, a magician if you want to call it that, and, uh, and I would have to perform. I'd be dragged into it. Um, of course, at times it could be annoying when you just wanted to just be yourself and not have to be an entertainer all the time. But definitely uh, outweighed by far um, was entertaining people, and they really enjoyed it. So I'll give you an example. Whenever, like if we went to a barbecue or wherever it might be, even if, if somebody saw me in a shopping mall and, and they were with their friends or something, they would stop me and ask me to do tricks and, sh and, and entertain them for a few minutes before I could go, go on my way. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's, that is something that I, I, I would say like not a lot of people have experienced at a young age, although there were a lot of people that wanted to learn. And, and as you rightly pointed out, you know, I, uh, 
for me to be able to improve and get more props and because it's a very expensive hobby and uh, it, it, it's become a lot uh, more affordable now but back then uh, you know, we, we didn't really have the internet as we know it today. You couldn't learn and do these things. Uh, whereas now you can go onto YouTube and, and learn anything you want. Um, back then I had to, um, I had to get close to magicians, uh, like real professional magicians around the world. Um, and in South Africa itself, uh, there was a magic shop in Cape town that I got close to. Um, so yeah, I had to find a way to fund that and to fund that was to train other people that wanted to learn how to do magic. <laughs> Fantastic skills to learn so early and, and mm. so industrious, which, which clearly has then created a pattern through your life, which we'll, we'll talk about. So, you know, I've just like you said, there's such curiosity with magic. What is the, what's the ultimate trick behind all these tricks? I mean, if, if you could put it down to one thing, there, there, <laughs> There's, there's strategies and not all that meets the eye. What is happening behind the scenes? I, I think if we're just talking purely magic, I think it's first of all to capture the attention of the audience, you know, so uh, and that applies to a lot of things in life. You need to first capture your audience's attention. Mm. Uh, now, it might sound devious, but in magic, this is how it works, but it's to misdirect from that point onwards. So capture the attention and then misdirect their attention or misdirect their, their point of view. And everything stems out of that. So uh, whether it's an upfront uh, misdirection, we call it, or, or a misdirection that happens in the middle or towards the end, there's always at some stage where the entertainer is misdirecting. First of all, gaining the attention, and then guiding the attention in the wrong direction so that you can carry out the task that you need to do and then bring them back to reality. Mm. Oh, I'd love to know if you've used that tricky trick um, in, <laughs> in marketing. <laughs> well, certainly, I mean, in marketing, if you really think about it, that, that's exactly what you do. You, know, you, you get attention and you direct the attention to, you focus it on on the on what you want the customer to focus on. You're certainly not going to focus on the, the, the weaknesses on your product. Yes. You're going to push their their attention towards all the strengths. Absolutely, fantastic marketing tactic. How do you think we could? You know, I mean, we don't have to go into into what our world looks like right now. We know it's quite messy. How can we weave more magic into our world without being a magician? What? <laughs> that. Good question. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the world is a pretty uh, strange place at the moment. And to be quite frank, I think it's been this strange for a long time. And I think that a lot of people have had their blinkers on or have been complacent um, throughout their daily lives. Uh, it's only when there's a huge incident of this, uh, you know, proportion that it it sort of exposes, you know, the, it lifts the veil on mm -hmm. on on what we previously we, we couldn't see. Um, I think there is magic <laughs> in not knowing, but you know, there there are obviously dire consequences for that too. I think that um, the the closest to magic that you can get in terms of your life, and especially in times like this and the way the world works, is to claim your sovereignty. Uh, and to understand the limitations of that, because I truly don't believe that it is possible for anybody to be 100% sovereign. And, and I mean this from a financial aspect and from a well-being and, and, and sort of holistic aspect, but you can get close. And, um, and your state of mind in, in knowing uh, you need to, if my happiness anyway is, is partly derived from no, by, by, how do I, how would I word this by, by maximizing my sovereignty. So, you know, I want to be independent in, in many ways as possible. And that includes the way I think. Um, so um, I think that there'd be a lot of happiness in, in knowing what's either good and bad out there, you know, and, and getting many, as many different perspectives on as many different topics as you possibly can. And I think that that, that is magic because there's no one, unless you live in North Korea or something, there's no one that's stopping you. There's a wealth of information out there. It's accessible like never before. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, there, is, there are little pockets of, of censorship, but for the most part, most of us are fortunate enough to have access to information and people, and we can, everybody's at an arm's length or a tweet away, uh, you know, that we can consult with. And um, yeah, so for me, that, that's how one could find a little bit of magic yeah. in today's times. It's such an interesting answer, Wes. So just give me a little bit more sovereign, sovereignty, sovereignty, tea. Yeah. Is, is or independence or independence, I would say. Independence. So, so which is why you're saying independence of thought, independence of being able to explore well, in what you yes, or or even just being financially depend uh, independent. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, you know, if we go back 30, 40, 50 years ago, and you know, it was much more the case, I believe, that, you know, you would leave school uh, and you would go and find a job or you would go to university and you had a plan, you had a career path and that's what you were going to do. Um, so you were put into the factory of school, uh, like a production line, <laughs> alphabetically sorted like products and, uh, you know, and by age, etc. And then you, you popped out the other end and you were given a grade and you were filtered out into different sort of careers, very much like a production line. Yeah. And, um, and under the, the veil of independent choices and, and things like that. But it's nowadays people are, have got access to information, freedom uh, to go on the internet and learn whatever they want to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, you know, obviously this specialized feels like doctors and if that, yes, I do encourage them to go and study uh, and <laughs> get good experience. But for the most part, you can go learn just about anything. You can go explore anything. You can find out anything. You can test anything in terms of uh, its validity. Um, so the days of just going through this production line and popping out the other side, and that's who you are labeled, and that's who you are for the rest of your life, go work for a corporation or a company. I think that's no longer the case. So, you know, for me, independence is the fact that I might want to, I might have an idea and I don't know if it's going to work, but I'll go and test it and it might work or fail. And if it fails, I'll change it or I'll give that up. I'll try something else. Um, and that, that independence, uh, you know, independence almost of spirit of thought, like that you want to do something and that you don't, you don't, you don't have to conform to, uh, it, you know, I've never done this before. Um, you know, what do I know about uh, opening a restaurant or what do I know about uh, starting a, uh, a financial a company? Um, if, you, if you've got an idea, you can go find the information, find the right people, collaborate, whatever it be. That sort of independence is what I'm getting at. You, you're self-sovereign, you're self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. On the financial side, it's being reasonably successful enough and uh, diverse enough, perhaps, that you, you feel financial independence. Now, that would be a relative term because for you, what's, what financial independence is completely different to what my financial independence is. Um, you know, it, it's not something which is uh, static uh, or, or the same for everybody. But that too, you know, I think that also brings happiness. And it's not to say money brings you happiness or wealth brings you happiness, but certainly independence brings you happiness, I believe. Um, and I apply this to everything, everything else, whether it's uh, in, you know, your relationships, everything. So, um, yeah, that's up to there so far. <laughs> fantastic concept in terms of the independence freedom because that's ultimately what we all want and striving for and mm. you, you brought this amazing concept up of sovereignty and and i see that as a pattern through your life and the fact that you've managed to create that sense of freedom being able to transition so almost seamlessly between multiple sectors industries different businesses which, which means you've really applied that feeling of, of, of freedom to be able to explore. How have you managed, most people find it difficult to maybe even focus on one thing and then really be super successful in, 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 that, in that one thing. And you've managed to explore this to the nth degree and cover, cover sectors. What do you think you've done well that has allowed you to transition between sectors, industries, jobs, businesses, etc. I honestly believe it's the people I've met along the way. So I have found people that, whether you want to call it a mentor or somebody that I look up to or that I believe in or I like the way they think, and I've associated myself with them. 
So that's helped me segue from one thing to another. And it's not to say that I've left the other thing behind. I've left the stuff behind that doesn't work for me anymore or, I, or I've lost a passion for. Because mm -hmm. just because I've got a passion for something or you've got a passion, so it doesn't mean you've always got a passion for it. But, and, and it's those, I think those people along the way that have connected, connected the dots for me. Um, I, I very much believe that. I haven't thought about it before until you've actually asked me now, but it, I think it's that. Because I, every step of the way, you know, if I go right back to magic, uh, when I was a kid, like eight years old, I was walking through a, a market, like a fair, and there was this, I was actually looking at a, another stand and, and I was totally intrigued. I've seen magic before, but I was totally intrigued by this guy who was um, demonstrating this, this magic trick. And I waited for the whole thing to close down. And I loved the way he entertained. I loved the way he spoke to people. I, loved, I was watching the crowd, the way they, they were, you know, completely engrossed in what he was doing, enchanted. So I waited until the show finished and I, I asked him to please take me on as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. So he's, that's how I started that. And, and it, I, there is a pattern because everyone has been like that, whether it's been financial trading of assets, equities, Forex, I've met the people involved, found the one that I, I can kind of relate to or I look up to or, or I res respect as being, um, you know, the, the one I want to emulate. Uh, and, and there, from there, it's, it's, it's gone forward. Um, I suppose it's very similar to back in the day when you have apprenticeships and things like that. So, yeah, yeah I think that's, that's the answer. I mean, even with real estate, same thing. Um, whether it's uh, digital currencies, same thing. Wow. Well, and if we look at just where we're at right now, so many people are having to transition and, and not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to, because maybe the industry they're in right now is no longer... Sure or it's been hard hit by the impact of lockdowns, etc. So would that be your message to them? So people were needing to make a very tough transition, maybe thinking, geez, I'm so old, I don't know anything about this next new thing I need to go into. Um, how do I do that? There's a lot of fear involved. Would, be, would that be your message? Go find someone and ask them to mentor you? Or is it more? I, I, think, I, I, think, I think that would be a great great start but obviously to generalize it onto onto those examples um would be very difficult because i mean you know not everything can be uh apprentice uh, you know you can't have an apprentice for just about everything you know in times like this also the, the master or the person that you're looking up to is probably also um mm, you know sure. getting their getting their house and in order and and the likes. However, I do think it's a good time with the, that natural pressure to, to learn and take on something. Um, and, and definitely the easiest way is to get a mentor. Although I, I wouldn't want to call it that because, you know, one can also get involved with people uh, that you want to emulate and contribute for them. And at the same time, it is apprenticeship, but you are actually contributing and making their life easier and at the same time you're absorbing what you're seeing and what you're doing in their industry mm. so exactly. you know an example would be mm. yes exactly so an example would be like if there was a trading floor and you weren't in a, you know like the old stock exchange if if you weren't a trader they would be to go on and clerk for a trader you know run the tickets through run the orders through and actually be around and hear the sights and sounds and the buzzes and the you know running the, what happens when there's a bad trade you'd, you'd, you'd be a party and a witness to everything um but people need to survive now yeah. so i don't know that that would be ideal you would need to be of value in a sense that you'd be able to be remunerated whilst you're doing that so a pure apprenticeship would be difficult yes absolutely however it's yeah of uh, don't do it on your own there's books there's online programs there's so many things that are free there are people around you but find those people who are doing it well and piggyback yes. on what they're doing well rather than uh, shortcut the process um through that. exactly um, yes exactly and, and i would say it's, it's much more efficient way of doing it you know to go and uh, learn how to do something for three years or four years in a school and to learn on the job on on site real life, real world, real things happening is a, is a completely different ballgame. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to because there's so many people who've done it so well and have put things on the net. I mean, the, world, the net is like a, a constant magic, yeah. actually. <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And 
uh, it, it's funny that my, my interest with magic sort of subsided with the growth of the internet, which is kind of ironic because you could learn more with the internet, but because of the, the internet was my new magic. Uh, when the internet came out, that was my source of wonder and, and you know, uh, my sort of entertainment uh, was this wealth of information. Now I can go learn anything. Just like I went and sourced books from, from all around the world and contacted magicians everywhere um, manually or, or the legacy way of doing things. Now I could just type on a few keystrokes and I could learn whatever I wanted to learn. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's right at your fingertips and most of it, so much of it is for free. And um, amazing. Yes, exactly. So you mentioned something about um, in, 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 your, in your notes before um, the show, the difference between sacrifice and investment. Because that probably comes up here when, when you're moving into something new. There's a bit of sacrifice, but there's a lot of uh, investment. Tell us what, what you see as the difference between that. Sacrifice and investment. I think for me anyway, uh, you know, it, it's just how you perceive it. Because if you've got a, if this is how I like to look at it. It's, you've got a, either a, a preference for the now or you've got a preference for the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Preference for the now would be, would be me uh, going and grabbing an apple and eating it, right? I'm hungry. Uh, let's alleviate that, uh, that desire or that hunger. Uh, a preference for the later would be taking the seed, planting the seed and watering it for X amount of time, growing a tree and then picking off my apples and eating them. So uh, I'm sacrificing the now for investment in the future. So that, that is what, that's what I was referring to there. And it, it comes back to time preference. So if you've got a low time preference or a high time preference, mm. you know, whether you're going to, you need to go buy that latest iPhone now and you take credit and you put yourself in on debt, or do you invest in the future where you can, you, you go and you work now so that later you can reward yourself or get something that's of worth of more economic value. You'll probably find with that principle of, sacrificing and investing uh, that you'll make wiser decisions in the future because you've had to work for that. Mm. So there's like a double whammy there. Mm. So that is something which, um, which I learned probably about, well, which something which I became very aware of and trying to apply manually and consciously every day um, about seven or eight years ago. And and ever since then, of course, you know, it can't be perfect, but, you know, every, every, whenever I try and think about something, um, whether it's a, a purchase or a, or a business or something, I always, um, that is one of the criteria I think about is, am I, am I um, scratching an itch or, or am I really investing in the future? Fantastic. And it's such a nice concept in terms of creating that financial freedom as well. Mm -hmm very much the decision making you need to make so maybe let's let's talk crypto a little bit or you've seen that that, that sure. as well in in in, yes. in light of that talk to us when when you look in right now as well a lot of sacrifice okay. we need him to cut down costs in in so many ways and you know so many people have lost jobs etc so mm. pickle balance to to strike the the sacrifice and 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 the investment um, talk to us a little bit about, from a financial uh, perspective, how these concepts are so important. Okay, yeah, sure. So if we just think about how the monetary system in the world works today, um, it is uh, money which is printed with endless supply. Uh, or let's look at the US example at the moment, where they need to fund uh, paychecks for, for uh, people who have been put out of work. They need, they've got deficits all over the place. So what are they doing? They're printing more US dollars. And what they're essentially doing is, is they're kicking the can down the road. So what they're doing is they are printing money now, so they're not making a sacrifice, and they are pushing the debt to the future. So what they're doing is almost the polar opposite. So mm. they are uh, literally eating the candy now instead of building the candy factory that produces candy in the future. Wow. And what that sort of culture does is it does create an overconsumptive sort of society where people, instead of investing in economic goods, economic good being something which is, which uh, produces an income, right? People start not investing, but spending money on 
flat screen TVs and cars and, and that whole culture of overconsumption, that cycle mm. is fed by this. And, and that again, that, so that would be a very hard time preference. So, so pre timing is the preference. We want it now, 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 we'll figure it out later. You know, let's just put something, a bandaid over it now and later we'll figure it out. We've got time. You know? mm. So in, in business, you can apply it to everything that you do, you know, whether it's the way that you hire your employees, what, what, what are your principles in terms of, uh, uh, of, of who you hire and how you treat your employees, whether it's, um, whether it's even the, the materials you use, if, you, if you're manufacturing, you know, uh, there's that principle again, high, high time preference, low time preference. And what you tend to find is the successful uh, people, like let's look at maybe a Warren Buffett of the world, is he's got a very low time preference. So he'll make an investment now, he has a vision of something, and maybe people will scratch their heads or something at certain investments, but he has a plan and he's willing to uh, invest now sacrifice the now you won't go buy the latest uh, stock that is already blowing through the roof and jump on the bandwagon right um just to uh, alleviate an itch he'll invest in something that is that he sees potential in the future and he'll reap the rewards later you know? mm. absolutely okay. when you're under pressure though so let's let's look at so many people under pressure right now so they have a very high mm. preference exactly Yet, we need to be very mindful of creating those action steps or, or taking action that creates the investment rather than not, you know, this, let's do something now, quickly cover the, the holes right now, but then create a bigger hole down the line. With what you're involved with and being so involved in, in the financial sector, what do you believe is the the prudent way to move, to take action right now or move forward? What, what, do you, what would you, you advise or what are you doing to? Um... Look, it depends on, on the person's situation. You know, there, there's, there's been people I've spoken to that are in very sad situations right now. Um, friends, relatives, uh, you know, abroad uh, that have just found themselves unfortunately in, in, in the wrong situation or in a, in a less desirable situation. And, you know, I think one has to just be careful of making hasty, wrong or bad decisions uh, in, in so doing you are affecting your relationship. Sometimes perhaps it's with a creditor or something like that, a supplier or with a landlord or whatever it may be uh, for self-preservation today, but then you ruin things for tomorrow. So I, I would say that would be like the most important thing. Yes. One does need to survive. And if you can't put, food on the table, you certainly won't be able to, to pay, pay the rent if you're not alive. <laughs> okay. But the, you know, that brings about um, a different discussion where if you've got your time preferences uh, aligned with, with, um, with what I was saying, then what you're going to do is, is you're going to negotiate and you're going to communicate effectively with, for example, a supplier, a landlord, or whoever it is that you're doing business with, whatever it may be, maybe it's a relationship, you'll, 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 you'll use more effective communication and not uh, act quickly to alleviate the pain and uh, in self-interest only um, because that will inflict harm, self-harm <laughs> at, at, at a later stage. So, you know, I don't think there is a quick fix for, there might be a quick fix for some things, but I don't think there's the, the best route is always just the quick fix, quick uh, knee-jerk reaction. Uh, I think that, one, even though things may seem urgent at the time, they, they do. We're in our own little bubble, our own little echo chamber, and it, it might seem the most urgent and most pressing thing that we have to do, and it, it, and it probably is, but one has to step out and look forward a little bit, maybe, I don't know, everybody's difference relative, so three months, six months, one year, where are we going to be in two years' time? Because nothing stays the same. Mm -hmm. And what will my action today what bearing will it have on me tomorrow? And I think that will help set people on the right path. And it doesn't mean that you mustn't try and go and do some work or, you know, do something quickly, get a job or, or whatever it may be. It just means think about where do you want to be a little bit further than today or tomorrow? You know? mm, mm, absolutely. Be more circumspect, even though the, the pressure is there or the heat is on. And what I like is you're bringing it back to people again. And, mm. um, 
this show is all about bringing humanity back to life and, and business. So talk to people, build the relationships. We're all in yes. this together. And I, and I like what you're saying there. So let's bring it back a little bit to crypto. Not everybody understands this world. And for a lot of people, it flip and scares the hell out of them. Um, <laughs> give us a little bit, if you, were, if, I, if you were to say I was interested in crypto, what reason would you, what three reasons would you give to me to try it at least? Okay. So when we refer to crypto, I, I personally would, I'm going to just say Bitcoin for now. Because yeah. I think anyway, besides the fact it's the, it's the one that I, I feel is, is the most sustainable, uh, it's just that everybody knows what Bitcoin is. So if I say crypto, there's like 2,000 of them, and I think that it's overwhelming. So there's no need to have 2,000, I believe, if, you know, in one's portfolio. So I would say Bitcoin, first of all, and I would say, again, it comes down to self-sovereignty and independence. So Bitcoin is an independent money that's not controlled by any government or any third party transactor payment processor or anything related to uh, an intermediary. So that, what does that mean? Well, it means this, if you live in Venezuela right now or in recent times or the 20 times that they've gone bankrupt, um, it means that your money can be inflated away to, to nothing overnight. You can wake up tomorrow or even Zimbabwe and a barrel load of, or a wheelbarrow load of the currency that you've been saving up, can't even buy a loaf of bread, okay? It can also be confiscated from you. How does that happen? Well, just recently, India decided to ban, for example, I can't remember the de denomination, but it was one of the highest ones. Let's just call it the thousand rupee note. And overnight, they banned the thousand rupee note. So all the thousand rupee notes that you had in your possession were with zero. So, you know, things like that can happen and they generally do that uh, to refinance themselves and uh, money laundering purposes. But looking away from the reasons, but they, they are in control of that currency. They can print more of it, less of it. They can destroy it. They can confiscate it from you. They can censor it. How do they censor it? Well, if you're supporting the wrong party, they can make sure your funds don't get to the party. How do they do that? Well, they just tell Visa not to do your transaction. Don't support WikiLeaks or don't support uh, Wikipedia or, you know what, uh, we don't like this country. You can't send money there, even though you want to buy a light bulb there. Uh, censorship can, is easy via the banks, via Visa uh, and then many other mechanisms. So it comes down to independence. That money that you have is in your, in your possession. You really know it's in your possession. It's nearly inconfiscatable unless obviously somebody puts a gun to your head. All right, and you give it to them. Um, but it's not confiscatable in the sense of tomorrow you could walk to your bank account and the balance might be zero or they might just block you out until you jump through hoops. So from that sense, independence, un unconfiscatable, uh, uncensorable. Uh, and you wanted a third reason, I would say certainty. There's a, there is a little bit of, there's a lot of certainty with Bitcoin. There's 21 million Bitcoins. There'll always be 21 million Bitcoins. And if you own one Bitcoin, you will always own one Bitcoin out of 21 million. Whereas if you own one dollar, I don't know how many dollars there are in the world. They keep printing them. I own one out of, and the more they print, the less value yeah. they have. And most fiat currencies, I think all of them have only lasted in their current iteration or in the iteration that they found themselves in uh, for about 60 years. Uh, so currently the US dollar since Bretton Woods has undergone a few changes, but we can, we can say it's had two iterations of the US dollar since, and it's had a couple iterations before, and then it had private US dollars amongst many banks. Uh, fiat money, which means by decree, in other words, the government says so, or basically holding a gun to it saying, take it as money and pay it for taxes. Um, <laughs> it doesn't last because it gets inflated away because there's always the temptation by those with the, the power or the keys to the printing press to print more whether it be to fuel a war, a war in Iraq or whether it be to uh, fuel a cure or a, what do you call it, vaccine for a pandemic uh, yeah. or to help uh, people that were artificially all put out of work. Uh, and that, that is a problem, whereas Bitcoin, it, as it currently stands, there's certainty. So you know there's 21 million 
you know how many you own out of the 21 and everyone can verify how much you own and it, you, it can be anonymous but every it, it can't be altered there it's near impossible to alter wow so what's the easiest way to get your toe in this water <laughs> Well, I think it's like anything else. I think there's a lot of good information on the internet. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good sites uh, that that can hold one's hand, and YouTube's a great a great instructor at times. Uh, there's a lot of good talks. I, you know, I think back in the day when uh, when I first got into Bitcoin, there was there was very little actually. We had these very fringe uh, notice boards on the internet where it was basically a bunch of hackers and, and that, and you really didn't know what was real or not. But nowadays there's a, there's a few good books out. There's the Bitcoin standard by Saifi Dinamous. There's uh, the internet of money by um, Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, there's mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. There are, there's quite a, a lot of good literature out there. Um, I have a podcast. Let's talk crypto podcast. Uh, it's let's talk crypto.io. Uh, that we have quite a few instructional and interesting discussions, panel discussions uh, about Bitcoin, how it works, about other cryptos, about money, about sovereignty, about gold, about all sorts of things. Uh, Sounds fantastic. So, how do we access yeah. that? Quiz? What, what's the... Okay, so you would find it by searching for Wes, Let's Talk Crypto on YouTube or Let's Talk Crypto space Wes on YouTube. Uh, or Google, uh, and you'll, you'll, I'll probably come up first. Awesome. Sounds like a very good place to go, given the reasons you've, you, you've given. <laughs> what would you say, if you span your whole entrepreneurial career since you were eight, <laughs> we don't know how you now. <laughs> what- <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> it's unverifiable. <laughs> <laughs> It's not certain. So, um, yeah. Quinn, what would you say the biggest barrier to you to success has been for you? I think it was uh, communication. I think, uh, or I don't think it's actually communication. I think it's the, the fear of rejection. I think mm-hmm. that, and I think I might have even got a little bit of that fear from doing magic. If I think about it, you never wanted the people to figure out the trick or make a mistake that exposed the secret. And that feeling when it does happen is even worse than being turned down on a sales call or something. It's really bad because your core function is to misdirect and make this person amazed, but then they have a gotcha moment with you. So um, I think that rejection is definitely something which, uh, which I, which I face all the time, you know, it's, it's a fear that I, that I face all the time subconsciously, but definitely where I look at the successes I might have had, and I'm speaking relatively here for myself, what I feel is a success for myself. Uh, I think that a lot of it stemmed out of where I took a step forward, where, I, I, where normally maybe I, I wouldn't have because I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure of myself or I wasn't confident enough or I procrastinated because just maybe something else will happen or, and, and, and that's all just this, the fear of, of going and doing it. And, um, and I think that, and I even know people, you know, that, that a, a lot of the, that they're being held back, you know, they're really good at what they do. They're really, really good at what they do. And they just need to communicate or just take that step, whether it's pick up the phone and connect with somebody and they, they won't do it. They, they will make every excuse in the book not to do it. And I think, you know, in real estate, having to do like cold calling and, and um, really step up and, and, and communicate and network and, and, and put yourself out there. And I don't mean out there like an entertainer or, or up and have to do public speaking uh, to that extent, but to, to take the initiative and, and, and put yourself out there, expose yourself in a way that maybe you won't get the answer that you wanted. And I think that holds a lot of people back. And I think if people can get over that, it's a huge barrier. Um, all the other bits and pieces, if you know what you're doing, if you're in the right field and you, you're technically good at whatever it is that you're doing, all those things will fall into place if you can just unlock those doors. So you've obviously got to a place where you can feel when that's coming, coming up for you. What, yes. Through what works for you to just go right through that barrier? I think... Uh, when it's something really, when I, rec- 
I, I recognize it. I get a feeling, <laughs> as you say. Um, uh, I, I kind of classify it. You know, is this a, is this a valid? Is this a real? What what are you really concerned about? You know, and um, and I think I learned this from my father when I was young. He said, like, what's the worst outcome of the scenario? What, let's list them. You know, uh, and he would say to me, like, okay. Um, I'm just going to use a random example. Okay. So it's it's like you need to get a property, for example, as an agent uh, when I was younger. And all it required, you had the phone number and you had the phone. And all you had to do was pick up the phone and phone the guy, uh, the owner, and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. And I uh, would like, to, you know, I do, this is what I do and this is et cetera. And, uh, you know, I'd like to market your property. Uh, cut a long story short. And to do that, uh, was difficult. It was really, really difficult. And, but what it unlocked uh, afterwards was amazing. So what would, what would he do is he would say to me, okay, so what, what, what's going to happen when you find this, this guy? Now? Okay. What's the best case scenario? He's going to say, yes, come and take photos of the house. Come see it. Come list it. Fantastic. He's like, okay, well, that's scenario one. And he's like, okay, what's, what's the lead, you know, sort of the next best. And so we would go through and maybe there'd be five or six, general scenarios that there would be at most and it's only then you'd come to the, and it'd be a manual process and then a manual process that you'd realize you know what, i could live with that i could live with that one too that one wouldn't be so bad and what would i do if that happened and then you would, could almost formulate a little plan a little roadmap for yourself um, now that's all internalized and but that's how i learned my father taught me that and and it, and i think only in the most extreme circumstances now where it's something which I think a lot of people would pause and have a thought about it. Uh, do I have to manually think about it now? Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, in everyday life, everything's an interaction. Everything is a, is a negotiation. Where all day, you'd be negotiating with people, um, even when you think you're not. It's happening subconsciously all the time. You're weighing up outcomes and you, you're choosing a path. Um, it's only those big decisions that you feel really hit you in the face and you need to now, it's crunch time. You know, then, then perhaps, you know, then I get the pen and paper out and, and really figure things out. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it's autopilot for now. Fantastic strategy that he taught you so early. And if you were to kind of span your life, because yes, I also, in the, uh, you know, I teach decision making and I always say, what's the worst that can happen? Think about that. Mm -hmm. What's the cost to you mm -hmm. to do this? And what's, what's the worst that can happen? Have you ever had a situation where the worst did happen? Good question. I have to really, really think hard about that. Um, yes, I mean, I've been completely and utterly rejected. And the thing was that because you had it, you were already anticipating it, you weren't surprised. So you, that was one of the outcomes that you had predicted. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you came away, you, you know, well, you know, that happened and you had already planned what to do about that. So whether that was preparing your mind for, for plan B or how you were going to react uh, to, to that, you had a plan in, in motion and I, I can't remember what the exact thing was, but you know, it might be a simple thing as I, the final negotiation on a property that I bought or something where I went in and this was my final thing and it was rejected and you know, I had to go to plan B uh, or whatever it might be, you know, but whatever the case was, um, there's always been, I wouldn't, I don't want to call it a fallback, but it, it, there's always been an anticipated next move. And that's the important thing, is that even if that worst thing happens, there's always another way or a different door to open or a reason or a learning from it or there's something. It's never all just bad. There's always an upside. Exactly. I think, I think, I think that because you've, you've anticipated it and you've planned for it, your mind is, is already acknowledging that, that that is a possible scenario. Mm. And there, there is life after that scenario. Something has to come next. Yeah. So you must, you, you must have a natural plan to what happens then, you know, um, yeah. and yeah. So there, but, but there's a lot of, there's this constant self-talk almost and, and moving yourself yeah. through that to, a, but, and to become so good at it, as you say, it's, it's actually natural for you now. You're going through those motions in your mind as, as you encounter. It's, the, mm. I, I think it's, it's mostly natural for the things that I do every day. Yes. yes. You know, obviously if I, if I start doing something different, that's new and, and I'm a little bit unsure, maybe perhaps even, you know, insecure about what I'm doing uh, because perhaps I'm jumping in the deep end of, of something new. 
uh, then yes, it will become a lot more manual again. And, uh, and I think that's natural for anybody, you know, like I did when I started uh, with, with real estate, you know, it was, it was a manual process. It didn't, I don't think really the age was too much of an issue, but I've got more experience now with people. I think when, you, when you're new, you knew you, you don't feel that you are, uh, I don't want to say good enough, but you, you I don't want to say fake it to make it either, but you, you almost feel that you are not worthy <laughs> of, of what you're doing right now because you're too new. Why would they want to use me? And then they could do somebody who's been doing it for five, 10, 20 years, you know? And those, those self-doubts uh, are stronger when you're new at something. Mm-hmm. And you're going to use the same strategy to get over this? What's the worst that can happen even though I'm new? Is, is, is that the same strategy? It's exactly, exactly the same thing, you know. Okay, let's, let's, let's list the outcomes from, from best to worst and let's, let's form a plan on what, what, what's going to happen, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very rare that you get to the worst case scenario because you're almost mentally prepared to to uh, to approach the situation, avoiding the worst case scenario because you you've mentally prepared and planned for it, okay. even if you don't realize it. Yeah. I mean, the mind is incredible. The minute you start giving it those instructions to think about, you're formulating solutions for each of those outcomes, and um, exactly. realizing you actually have the solution should that happen. So thank exactly. you. Exactly, it's, it's it's really nice and insightful. So you in a, a highly competed market, real estate, um, that, that's been impacted generally, well, throughout the world, through, um, through the current scenarios that we're in, but you're also in an environment, a little uh, island of Mauritius. So you're in a highly competed market in a very small market. So it's an overcrowded market. How, uh, yet uh, having um, experienced your service ethic and um, the way you do things, you're a cut above the rest. What do you think you've done specifically to be able to compete so well in this kind of market? It, it is a tough market, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that any any real estate market is a tough market to be honest uh, i think uh, it, real estate is a is a tough business because of all the technology out there now and because there's low barriers to entry into this type of 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 work uh, that being you could walk out tomorrow and and you know put a for sale sign up and or for rent or whatever and 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 so and get going but um i think that treating it as a real business and not as uh, you know as a lottery and and applying the same principles that you would for any other business, whether it be customer service, whether it be accountability, whether it be um, the same, you know, similar marketing strategies, uh, um, you know, this is the same print, just like any other business uh, where, you, where you look after your clients and try and create clients that are loyal and come back and, 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 and find value in your service. I think that's the way, that I try my very hardest uh, to operate um, and obviously fall short sometimes, but for the most part, I would say that's the reason why I'm able to compete. And, and I think also because I, I, I do sort of um, have a lot of control and or over what, over the way I want to do things again, come back to independence. You know? yes. Whereas, you know, if you are one of 20 or 50 in an office, your independence is, severely uh hindered i believe you know uh, you can't act um independently and in, in in your interest so i think that also helps we operate a company which which i do have other people working for us i've got other agents and i've got family members working for, for us but i but i'm able to make decisions on the on the spot uh and independently of franchises you know brand names and other sort of centralized controlling parties and intermediaries that um, that can often just uh, hinder your your service towards the end user the client you know so i think that that has been helpful for us when we especially when we're competing against some of the bigger brands Mm, i think it comes back to also what you said earlier it's about the people side of it where you are actually developing relationships with your clients and you hold relationships for for years and years and years so you become I, I do. a person to turn to when when a new home is is required and um so I, to my mind that's your your secret sauce is the way in which you care about your clients and and it just it doesn't yes. not a transaction for you there yes. there's so much more to this it's almost becomes like a life 
long friends. Yes, no, and I enjoy it. I really enjoy it. I think that's another thing. So I, I actually, that has been the best thing and why I will likely always be involved with real estate. That is because it's afforded me the opportunity to meet such amazing people yes. and have you know relationship with them besides of the property. You know, we talk about many different things and we and from so many different sectors and from different countries and. I, I just, I really, really, really enjoy it. And it's almost the sad uh, result that they end up getting a house or they end up selling their house or they end up, you know, <laughs> it's strange, but that's how, how it feels in a way if I really think about it, you know. Um, yeah. And what a magic experience to make that happen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, so, Wes, without me having actually asked you the question direct, you, you've spoken right through the last hour about humanity, actually. Everything you're talking about is, actually comes back to that humanity. But maybe you can just sort of, as a, as a you know, sort of second last uh, thought, what do what yeah. you think it would make a, a huge difference to our world if we brought humanity squarely back into business? Humanity in the sense of ethical and ethics and, um, Being and the doing the right thing. Yes, yes. Going yeah. to this principled caring. Uh, humanitas is just being the caring kind mm. in what you say and you've been doing through your businesses. Yeah, look, I think, I think it's very difficult for us to, to achieve, but not impossible. Uh, the, the thing is, the way society is geared up, it is very much... Um, fueled by that, that, that hard time preference. So people are always acting in the now, now self-interest and at the expense of others. So others, including themselves, their future self. So I, I think that it's, it's feasible, but I think we have to find the core root of, of what, uh, what is causing this. And I think that the core root is the way that our societies are set up. And that is, it drives and fuels us in that direction to be the opposite of what, what you're mentioning now, you know, to bring humanity back, it actually pushes humanity out of it. Yes. Um, and that for me, uh, I hate to bring it back to it, but for me, it starts on, on what we all fighting for all the time and that's money. Uh, and if we solve the money problem, uh, I do believe that a lot of other issues will be easier to solve because if you look at most issues in the world that all, you know, problems, if you go back far enough, you'll find that money uh, was, was involved at some point. Mm. And, and I do think that if we can solve the money issue and how we interact with each other and money at the end of the day, if you really think about it, is a form of communication. Yes. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm paying you, I'm, ex I'm exchanging value with you for something, you're giving me something of value and I'm giving you, this, this stuff that's supposed to re represent value. Um, and and there's, there's a bit of a communication happening there. We've, 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 we've formed an agreement, otherwise we wouldn't exchange. Um, and, and since we're communicating with each other all day around the world, whether it's via visa, network, or in bank, you know, money transactions, or, or even just any transactions happening around the world, um, I think that if we had to solve the money issue, it would solve a lot of problems uh, related around humanity, mm. uh, especially that of time preference. And, and if you can solve the time preference issue, or at least improve it greatly, I think that we would all treat each other differently. Um, I think our, our habits and our routines would be completely different in a positive way. Absolutely. However, what can we do? We can't change the world. So uh, no, we can, but we can't just snap our fingers and change it. So Absolutely. small steps. And I just think that would be one of the very first steps. And what can you do if that doesn't happen? I think you can consciously um, apply that, that time preference principle, even if money doesn't change. You can still apply that in everyday life, whereby, you know, um, perhaps like in this COVID-19 situation, there's a lot of people I've seen that... Uh, can't pay the rent. Okay, that's that's one thing. They communicate with the landlord, they form a plan, and that's great. There's a lot of people who can afford to pay the rent, but have chosen not to pay their rent. Yes. They said, no, yes. you know, I've been forced into this situation, and I don't know if I'm going to have money in six months' time. So I'm going to act for me now mm. and preserve my, my capital 
at the expense of my future self because I'll have a bad name, bad relationship with my landlord and upset a lot of external parties, main one being the landlord who perhaps has a mortgage or has other debt or it relies on as an income, even if there's no debt, uh, no mortgage on the property. Um, and, and it has a, it has a ripple effect that, you know, and it has a chain effect. That guy affects that one, that one, that one, that one. So instead what, in this example, what this person could do was negotiate with the landlord, perhaps a reduced rental, but sustain the relationship um, so that your future self isn't compromised mm -hmm. and so that you don't compromise other people around you. And, and if you apply that in business, I think it's exactly the same, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's with your staff or with uh, your supplier or your customer. And it comes back to, again, is in, in terms of just thinking it through, you know, what is your relationship? Well, yes, we may not be able to change what's going on on a global level or on a, maybe even a country level. However, we can change our own relationship with money, given that that is such a source, such a barrier in, in so many people's lives, maybe nearly everybody's life in some way, manner or form, money becomes a barrier. So how do you solve that relationship that you have with it and start thinking differently about it and, and talking to, to other people and solving that for yourself, at least um, in, in, in the um, year and now? Thank you for yeah, the, in the present. Yeah. Right now. So one last question. If you could speak to all 7 billion people on our planet, right? What message you would you want to give to to everyone? Hmm. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I have to really, really think about that. Um, I would say that although there is although there is an abundance, uh, you know in the world and, and one, you know, wanting to have sort of a positive attitude and outlook on life and that, and um, one shouldn't be wasteful uh, with it. mustn't be in, in the frame of mind that there's always more and there's always, you know, it, it, you, there is merit in there's more, there's abundance and feeling an abundant life and that the universe always gives to you in that. However, it's to treat what's given to you and what you do get with respect and, and, and it, it's important because there's people who don't have that and, and, and who haven't been afforded those opportunities and are not able to see things yet, perhaps, or haven't come to the same conclusions um, as perhaps you do have or haven't been, I hate to use the word lucky, or lucky like you might have in a certain aspect of life. And our, my message would be is to appreciate and treat it with respect um, because that's the only fair and right thing to do for those who are on looking or those who don't have, or those who are still working on it or still getting there or arriving at the same place or, or whatever it may be. Um, I think that would be my message. And, um, and, and I've even got a second message and that would be to treat, to treat everything with a little bit of skepticism, but at the same time to have an open mind. And, um, and, and the reason I say that is because, if you don't have an open mind, then you won't, uh, you won't be able to, um, uh, to take that leap forward and, um, and to try those things and to, uh, to see what happens next. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate, respect, keep an open mind. Uh, thank you, Wes, for, mm. for sharing your magic insights with us and for showing mm. that you can cross barriers, you can make transitions, you can... Uh, choose to do something completely different and we have the opportunities to to create that freedom for ourselves if we so choose but it's the way we think about things and um, there is always the way thank you so much for for showing us that today no my pleasure my pleasure i really enjoyed it i hope i hope it was interesting at least <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. I, I could pick about a hundred more topics that we could dive into very deeply <laughs> with <laughs> incredible mind. So uh, for those of you listening to, to hear more shows like this, to hear more amazing um, guests like Wes, please subscribe to Business with, Without Barriers. It's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, uh, on all the major uh, platforms. And let's remember, remember that as fellow business leaders, 
we can connect in love, we can calibrate for truth, we can co-create value through our work. And very importantly, we can celebrate in gratitude every single day as we make steps, uh, take steps forward. So we do that, bring humanity back to business, and together we can create a human story that we're proud of. Till next time.